All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli Yim. I'm an attorney at Beresford Booth with the Business and Real Estate Group. And uh, don't let the uh, the name of the group fool you. We we also uh, get involved with employment matters from time to time. Uh, included in that are some wage hour disputes or uh, ideally matters that come to us before they become disputes. And so uh, in an effort to help people get out on the front end, um, whether as an employer or an employee, um, well, I thought maybe today we could talk about, you know, how to how to make the uh, decision on on-call time uh, when it comes to wage and hour matters. Uh, and you can imagine that these days, it's a little trickier as the lines kind of get blurred a little bit between work and personal space. Um, and so uh, just feel like it, it might be uh, something that is also a little timely. Uh, so it's one area of the law where, uh, you know, we, we are left to kind of try and consider, you know, what constitutes on-call time. And uh, I guess I would say, here's the spoiler alert, uh, same spoiler alert that you have whenever you're faced with a lot of these kinds of legal questions, which is uh, there's a lot of gray area as to what constitutes on-call time. So we're going to walk through that today, kind of the, the inquiry that occurs uh, with the courts uh, to, to try and better understand the factors that are uh, considered when, when you look at on-call time and what is compensable time versus what is not compensable time. So like a lot of these matters, uh, let's see, I'll try and, here we go. That we can imagine that there are several circumstances that might give rise to an on-call dispute. So does an employee have to remain on site or do they have to stay nearby? Um, you know, sometimes people have questions if they have a cell phone that they're required to carry with them at all times and be on call with that's work issued. Um, people have questions about that or, or do they have to, uh, on a regular basis, be available to work or report to work or otherwise perform, uh, in their, you know, their, their normal job responsibilities, uh, in the course of their being on call. And so those are just, you know, the kinds of things that people have to look at. And, and really the central question that we're left with is, is this time compensable? So we start really with the Fair Labor Standards Act. And there's nothing in, in this section. So this is section 207 um, that should surprise anyone. It basically sets forth the definition here that your work week is 40 hours uh, unless your employee receives compensation for employment beyond that. And if so, it should not be any less than time and a half. So again, I don't think that's surprising to anyone, but if we go a step further and we look at the code of federal regulations uh, under on-call time, it tries to take it a step further. I'm not sure that this is as um, clean uh, division as you could expect here. An employee is required to remain on call uh, on the employer's premises or so close thereto that he cannot use his time effectively for his own purposes is working while on call. So clearly, if you're on the premises uh, and can't use the time effectively for your own purposes, you're working. But an employee who's not required to remain on the premises but just leave word as to where they will be, that's not working on call. This seems like a very uh, large oversimplification um, because we have since seen that courts have made the determination that even if you are on the premises, you may not be on call. So it tries to set forth, I, I think, a clean uh, uh, distinction between being on call and not on call. But uh, I don't know that this is particularly successful in and of itself. And so the result is that we're left with really the courts trying to make this determination. And so foremost among the cases then is this case from 1992. It's a Ninth Circuit case. And, and 
looking at the 30,000 foot level then, um, really looking from, from an overview perspective, I feel like this to me is the clearest way to make the distinction between on-call time and not on-call time. If you are engaged to wait, that is compensable. Engaged to wait. If you are waiting to be engaged, that is not compensable. And so the key word there clearly is engagement, right? Does the employer engage the employee? So if you are engaged fully at the time, that is compensable. So you can imagine then, let's take it in the context of communications. If you have to monitor a radio, if you have to be so attentive so as to not miss a communication and know that there, um, there are several emergencies that will come up during the course of that time, you are actively engaged to wait. That is compensable time. If you are, I would use the example, just carrying around a cell phone, waiting for a call that could come in at any time. Some, most of the time it doesn't come off hours, but if it does come in, you're waiting to be engaged. That is not compensable. So again, there's, there's some gray area to what I just explained, but that to me is the easiest way at a 30,000 foot level to think about what is compensable versus not for on-call time. Now, really though, that Owens case uh, sets forth two lines of inquiry that employers and employees should consider. The first line of inquiry is, what is the degree to which the employee is free to engage in personal activities while they're on call? Um, and we're going to look at that more closely in a second. Uh, my little icon there will tell you the court sets forth a list of, of those factors. So um, there is that inquiry, line of inquiry. The second is, is there some other agreement between the parties that the court should consider where employer and empl employee both, there's been a meeting of the minds and they have by express term or by constructive terms, agreed to some arrangement for compensation for on-call time. So those are the two lines of inquiry. The, the first one is really interesting, and this is the one that, that courts across all the circuit courts in the country that have had on-call cases, um, they, have, to varying degrees, have put their thumb on the scale for some of these factors. And and really, it, it, it's a it's a mixed bag of decisions. But again, they've all wrestled with this question: Did the employee have use of their on-call time for personal purposes? And there are these seven factors that are not meant to be exhaustive by any means, but merely to be um, uh, suggestive or illust illustrative of of what the court should consider. Um, they say it's not exhaustive, and yet the courts do go point by point in looking at several of these things. So first one, kind of hinted to this or alluded to this earlier, is there an on-premises living requirement? Now, again, not dispositive in and of itself. You can imagine being a, for example, a property manager who lives on the premises. And that may be a requirement of their employment that they, they can't perform their job um, adequately without being on the premises, you know, as far as the way their job description is laid out for them. Um, okay, but do they still have time for personal purposes? Like, are they still able to read a book or watch TV or, you know, can they run out on an errand or, if, if, you know, there are other factors that be, can be considered where that is not dispositive in and of itself. You're not on call. And you can imagine the absurd results if you thought something like, well, living on premises, check that off. And therefore, you're on call 24-7, uh, you know, for, for the entirety of your course of employment. That, that, that's absurd, right? Um, so, but it is a factor. 
that the court weighs. Is there an on-premises living requirement? And courts have come out on both sides of the equation with different living arrangements. So um, it is something it, the court weighs, but is not dispositive. Uh, are there excessive geographical restrictions? So can you, do you have to not only be in a location, but do you have a, a certain radius? You can't travel more than 10 miles away or five miles away in, in the event that you have to report for an emergency. That would be a geographical restriction. Uh, frequency of calls. That, that's a big factor. You can imagine there are some positions where you can think about firefighters where on average, you know, they may have three, four or five calls a night versus someone else who may be on call. Um, but the frequency may only, only be, may be called in on their personal time twice in six months. Okay. So again, the frequency of calls, uh, is the fixed time limit for response unduly restrictive. So are, are you, are you required to be within 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes of responding and, and working, uh, at your employer's behest? Um, can the employee easily trade on call responsibilities? If you are the only person that can perform your job responsibilities and therefore you're unable to trade off, that is, that is something that um, you can imagine would be particularly restrictive. Uh, I believe the, the, the penultimate bullet point here is showing the uh, Owens factors age of 1992. Uh, can the use of a pager ease restrictions, uh, right? Can you be on call without having to be near a landline? Obviously that's that's become uh, uh, less relevant uh, as, as cell phones have become ubiquitous. Uh, and finally, did the employee actively engage in personal activities during on-call time? It's hard to make the argument that you were on call if you were able to take a vacation, participate in some event, you know, you know run, run a marathon, um, go ahead and attend all of your child's uh, sporting events on weekends and and yet still try and claim that as on call time it's it's hard to um, make that argument when when you have pretty pretty much had unfettered uh, access to your own personal time so uh, these kinds of things and, and there are other things that have been weighed you know if 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 you are let's say you in the medical field and um, there's a limitation on whether you can consume alcohol or not. That's something that could be considered. So anything that I think infringes on your use of your personal time for personal purposes, that is going to be weighed by the courts. And, and these Owens factors um, provide some shape to that, even if they're not exhaustive. Now, the second line of inquiry is you know, uh, should be a little easier for the court. And, and I don't know that the courts spend as much time looking into that because uh, they will look at, you know, is there some compensation scheme in place for, for call-in work? Has there been a meeting of the minds where this is going to be the, the overtime compensation policy and the parties are all in agreement on that and have been as they entered into this contract together? So that can be by express terms. Right. Here's the policy. Um, all the parties agreed to it. And, and this is the arrangement that that the court will uphold. Now, a constructive agreement can get a little um, more open to interpretation. So when we say constructive, is is there an agreement that arises from the employee's decision to continue working under some policy? So maybe there was not an express term but the parties have been working under some arrangement for some period of time. And so the employees continue continuation under those um, circumstances has resulted in essentially a constructive agreement to what is and is not on call compensable time. So uh, that's really, that's really it. I mean, I think those two, whether it's the, the Owens factors here, one line of inquiry or the contract terms, that, that's really what the court between those two lines of inquiry will use 
to make the determination. And so like, just, just to, to put this in context then to wrap up, uh, you can imagine then that ideally you would have some th given some thought as an employer or an employee into whether the, the position is one that may result in some on-call time being required. And if so, that's where, you know, we can often help think through what the sticking points may be or may not be. And, and if you can get out in front of it, if, if you can rely on some clear arrangement as to whether something is an on-call requirement or um, if there's some uh, overtime policy in place, uh, that that's what we can help with. And so uh, I've put here uh, my contact information, email and our phone number at the firm. And any of those of us on the business and real estate group would be happy to answer any questions you have, whether you're on the employer side or the employee side. And uh, yeah, hopefully that suffices as a, a quick primer into what uh, what is compensable on call time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.